Thank you for joining. Uh, this is a Snack and Learn this morning, a WSP Snack and Learn on equitable transit-oriented development. And this is really a case study on guidelines uh, prepared for the city of Raleigh on equitable transit-oriented development. So we're gonna talk about what is equitable TOD. There's a lot of different definitions of that. Um, equity and opportunity, how we prepared the plan, what strategies, what actions are in the plan, and then key takeaways and update on where that plan is right now. So we've got uh, three speakers this morning, myself, John Lochran, I lead uh, WSP's National Urban Design and Placemaking Practice. Um, Jason Hardin with the City of Raleigh, worked very closely with Jason, he's a senior planner on creating these guidelines. And Miranda Zhang, uh, who's our Northeast Urban Design Practice Lead at, at WSP for Urban Design. So why, you know, the question really is why would you plan for equitable outcomes? Like, like why would you, would you, why did we, we start this project in the, in, in the first place? So really equity, be, equity is the end goal, but it's really about sustainability, livability, and opportunity. It's really about taking an integrated approach and process to achieve equitable outcomes. So this is a, a growing equity around transit. Transit really improves equity, it improves access, it connects people to jobs, it provides mobility. Um, and really was about how leveraging those investments in transit can improve equity. So these are some examples, um, really high quality transit. We're talking bus rapid transit in the case of Raleigh, light rail, uh, can really just increase access to opportunity. You know, in Hartford, Connecticut, their bus rapid transit line made 6,000 more jobs accessible by transit. That's, that's an amazing number. So, and if you pair that with affordable housing, um, it just really exponentially increases those opportunities. So this is an example of Denver where they are proactively creating affordable housing around transit. And then finally, what's really unique about this plan is, is it's about equity and policy, but it's also understanding that you need to create a great place. And, and you can do that if you think about that ahead of time, really great place, great community, great neighborhood anchored by transit. So the way that, that, that this plan really maximizes benefits in Raleigh is, is, you know, we started with the proposition that we wanted to consider the share of growth that should occur near high quality transit. In this case, bus rapid transit, Raleigh's a, a rapidly growing metro, so how much of that growth should be near, near transit? Um, and then how do we share those benefits equitably across all regions of the city, not just areas that have BRT, and then really how do you create a plan that's specific to each station? So with that, I'm going to pass that to Jason, who's going to talk a little bit about, about the region itself. So I'm Jason Harden with the City of Raleigh's Planning Department, and I'll provide a little bit of background here on the City of Raleigh and, and where we're at, and more importantly, how that shaped the approach to this planning process. So you have to start with the fact that Raleigh is continuing to add a lot of jobs, a lot of population, uh, Research Triangle Park and related investments have created um, a huge boom in terms of the economy of the region. And also importantly, that has translated into a, a population growth that's high, but a land area growth that's significantly higher. So as we've grown, we've grown very rapidly outward. And those two facts, that population growth and the way we've grown, sort of shape the situation we're in right now. So next slide. So the, the implications are obvious and these are the kind of things that are happening in a lot of cities, but I think they're particularly acute in, in Raleigh and many other similar cities in the Sun Belt. So the commutes are getting longer, people are frustrated with that. At the same time, changing household sizes and changing preferences are leading to very high demand for walkable places close to opportunity. And Raleigh, like some other cities, did not make a lot of those places. And so that is creating some very intense competition and housing affordability accordingly is decreasing. So next slide. So in recognition of that fact and the fact that Raleigh has traditionally grown around driving and has a relatively um, modest transit system compared with, with older cities. A few years back, the, the community, including the county, came together and agreed on a plan to significantly upgrade and fund transit. And we're midway through implementing this, 
but it involves expanding frequent service, 15 minutes or less, a commuter rail line that connects Raleigh to Durham, also RTP, and then what we focused on in this project, which was bus rapid transit, so 20 miles of that extending out in each direction from the core of Raleigh, and that being the opportunity nearer term to really start to think about where the city grows. And this map illustrates those four corridors um, in a little bit of a state of flux, but the general outlines of, of where BRT will serve is known. So we were able, to, to focus in on these particular places, which also happen to be those places for the most part where we've seen a lot of interest in development and a lot of affordability pressures as well. So next slide. So with all that as background, this is a look at the approach that we took to the plan. And obviously it touches on some pretty sensitive issues, uh, displacement, housing affordability, all, blurring together into this conversation. So we did a lot of listening, uh, had a lot of in-person and other um, input opportunities and tried to understand um, people's real concerns here about affordability and equity. And there's a lot. So, and this is gonna be an ongoing conversation. It's certainly not something that it's possible to um, agree on and agree on the solutions to uh, that quickly, but the conversation is is essential and an ongoing conversation is happening here. So next slide. So again, it boiled down to these couple of key questions. Given that Raleigh is traditionally grown around driving and given that that is no longer as viable a strategy, how much do we want to try and consider accommodating more population along these BRT corridors and at the exact same time thinking about how we can ensure that that housing is and the strategy overall is allowing current residents to continue to live there if they choose and to make sure that there's options available at a range of income levels. Next slide. So the way we did this fundamentally is again starting from that point of people are coming here for jobs and opportunity. That is not really up for debate. So an option of just don't change isn't realistic because it doesn't mean that those people vanish. It simply means that they come and live in a different part of the region. And given that the project focused on the places that have the most transit and are the most walkable, if we're not accommodating places for people to work and live there, then people are going to live and work in places that aren't walkable and aren't served by transit, uh, which is when you frame it that way, I think a lot of people start to realize that is not an ideal outcome. And so we had a lot of discussion about that point, but the way that we really help people work through it was a game where people got a map, and that's what you see on the slide there, of Raleigh and the surrounding areas with just a few key areas highlighted and the BRT corridors highlighted in downtown as well. And they were given, and they worked in groups, they were given a set of blocks that represented the estimate of future population growth in the region. And the assignment was, where does it make the most sense for these blocks people to live and to work? They could, the rules were simple. You could put them anywhere on the map, but you had to put them on the map. So you can't do what so often happens in planning processes is just sort of wish people away. If you don't um, change the zoning or you don't accommodate development, it's also often the assumption is they just vanish. We know they don't. So this forced people to work through that trade-off about more change in these places versus uh, continuing a more auto-oriented and sprawling development pattern. And so when we framed the question that way, it turned out that, that every single group that participated in the activity in person and the online survey results as well were overwhelmingly in favor of growing more around transit. And we felt like that was a very successful way to pose that question and to not even really encourage, but just force people to work through these real world trade-offs that do happen, whether or not people often want to acknowledge it. Next slide. So okay. with that, Miranda is going to talk a little bit more about the uh, approach to the planning process. 
Yes, yeah, so I'm just gonna gonna pass this to Miranda right now. But really, when we talk about the strategies, uh, uh, what really makes this plan unique is really, um, you know, it recognized that affordability is becoming a challenge, and it got ahead of that. It didn't wait for it to happen. It got ahead of it. Um, but I think when you see the, the the strategies that and actions, it really took a two pronged approach that considered housing affordability, access to access to the region, plus also about creating a place, which I think makes this plan a little bit unusual. So Miranda. Sure. Uh, thank you, John. Next slide. So um, the WSP team worked closely with the city of Raleigh and also the sub consultant HRA on this um, equitable development around transit project started in 2018. And with the goal of setting a citywide TOD planning framework, we delivered the equitable TOD guidebook that was published last summer. Uh, the guidebook includes um, both a policy foundation and a set of urban design principles that we believe are essential to fully and also actively uh, realize the benefits of transit investment in Raleigh. And the full report is available on the city's website and we'll talk about the five key components of the guidebook in the following slides. Uh, next. Uh, the equitable TOD starts with equitable development goals. Uh, Raleigh is growing fast and the key questions here are uh, how much of the growth should be in the BRD corridors and how to uh, leverage the growth around transit to address equity and affordability. So by identifying and also examining the development capacity of soft sites in the BRT corridors and compare them with uh, the market demand, uh, we identified three different growth scenarios as shown on the screen. Uh, these uh, scenarios were presented to the Raleigh communities with the Lego game, as Jason just mentioned, and 75% of the people voted for higher density or uh, they grow around transit scenario. Uh, which represents about 40% of the future city, future, uh, city growth in the BRT corridors. Next. Um, as John mentioned, uh, equitable TOD means creating compactable, uh, sorry, compact, walkable neighborhoods with easy transit access. And the most importantly, to create great places and experiences that are exclusively for everyone. The guidebook introduced um, six uh, design principles that are commonly found in the design and implementation of successful TOD. It covers mix of uses, development density, repurposing and infill development, complete streets, uh, parking management, and public realm design. Next. And for each of these design principles, they are coming uh, with several key strategies that should be always considered as a starting point of the station area planning and design. And the guidebook also specifically uh, defined their uh, unique application to the Raleigh context. Next. Well, um, every station area faces unique challenges and uh, opportunities. Uh, grouping the stations with similar uh, characteristics will help to uh, more methodically establish key strategies as a, a planning framework. The equitable TOD station area topologies were defined based on both the, of the existing uh, neighborhood context and also future development potential. And all the stations in the BRD corridors uh, were assigned to one of uh, two of these five topologies. Next. Uh, the next section of the guidebook is equitable TOD policy toolkit, so which um, consists consists of zoning tools, affordable housing tools, and uh, equity, uh, equity programs. The zoning tools includes uh, three parts, um, as shown on the slide. Uh, they are TOD overlay zone, TOD residential zone, and future zoning changes. The guidebook provided definitions of uh, each of these tools and also illustrated detailed criteria of application with examples so users of the guidebook can easily apply. Next. Uh, we won't go to uh, much details today, but I do want to highlight uh, the density bonus of the TOD overlay zone. Uh, it allows 50% additional heights in return for providing 
uh, certain affordable units in new development. And it is a critical part of the zoning tools that leverage higher density around transit to create more affordable housing units for the people who need the transit access the most. So from here, I will turn it back to Jason to talk about more um, of other uh, policy tools. One of the things that I think is notable about this planning process is it got, as you saw with the, the zoning slide, it got fairly detailed in its recommendations. And that was incredibly helpful because it enabled us to do what we're doing now, which is essentially immediately turn around and take the plan and start implementing it in terms of changes to the zoning code, which are underway, mapping some of the overlay zones, which is a process that's underway, and also looking at some city investments. So uh, obviously a lot of talk about affordability and some of the specific recommendations that came out of that are acquiring properties along those four BRT corridors, which is happening. In fact, uh, we're set to close on a pretty major property along one of those um, just that was announced in the last couple of weeks. Helping existing homeowners with rehab and other homeownership cost the city does that but looking at ways to boost spending there given the the pressure on affordability in some of these neighborhoods anti-predatory purchase is something we hear a lot about the concern that long-time property owners are essentially being taken advantage of uh, through not necessarily realizing the full value of their property so this is a more informational and outreach task again that the city wants to step up Working with existing communities and where we can, uh, employment and internship opportunities with uh, residents along the corridors, we think that's a great opportunity. That's another thing we started to do. Business grants, so there's, there's a challenge and an opportunity for businesses. Certainly more customers are likely to be living nearby, but helping them access the capital and other resources they need to tap into that growing market is gonna be key and not necessarily something that every Existing small business has the resources to do, so there's a role with the city to help with that. And then, this may be obvious to people, but we wanted to make it obvious to plan participants and continually hit the theme of increasing housing supply as a strategy, not the only strategy, but one without which none of these other strategies are, are in the end gonna be successful. Next slide. A lot of funding you heard about, so a couple of big, efforts. One was an affordable housing bond that has recently passed that will provide $80 million for acquiring property along the corridors and other key locations in Raleigh. And then the second one would be a new one, what we've called the equity fund. And that's similar to uh, a tax increment financing district where we're looking at taking a percentage of property taxes from new development and plowing that back into these equity goals for the corridor. So probably a lot of affordability, but also some other possibilities as well. It could be support for community organizations or public art or pedestrian safety. We'll probably use some additional methods of getting feedback for understanding <clears throat> those priorities, but certainly think affordability will be a big part of that. And as these corridors develop, this will be a pretty significant source of, of revenue for actually making some of these goals happen. Next slide. So I mentioned that we don't think that this conversation is over by any means, and it shouldn't be. So in fact, we're, we're doing some specific station area focused planning along one of the corridors, and we'll be following that up in coming years. And that's an opportunity to do a deeper dive on zoning changes along the corridors to make sure that we're getting, again, those two basic questions, the amount of development that supports transit and provides options and then that helps provide some affordable options and continuing to work with small businesses the equity fund how do we set that up and and actually start to use it and then tracking this so the idea of the zoning overlay with the bonus it's been tried in a lot of places and the results are pretty mixed so we want to make sure that if it needs to be recalibrated then we're tracking the production and we're able to do that in the coming years Next slide. Okay. Okay. So just um, so so in closing, 
Um, re really just, you know, to address equity, you have to have a policy solution and a placemaking solution really to create a complete community that addresses both. Uh, Raleigh was a little, you know, Raleigh is a fast growing metro. So it was how do you create a plan that actually, you know, taps into that and leverages that. Um, and finally, you know, we really was about identifying new revenue sources to address the housing affordability issues. Um, and once again, very implementation focuses, Jason just, just, uh, uh, spoke of. So that's our formal presentation. We're going to go to questions and answers. And um, they, I hope you're asking those in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, John, um, Jason, and Miranda for a great presentation. Uh, so before uh, we stop the Q&A, uh, just a reminder that the presentation is available in the handout box to download. And also you can ask questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Uh, so we received some questions from uh, on registration, thank you very much for entering those. We'll, we'll start with the first question. How would you alter your strategies for a city with stagnant population growth, where the transit asset operates in a disinvested dis area? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start that and see if anybody else wants to, to, to answer that. But, but I think too, that where, you know, once again, Raleigh was, was a situation where the population was growing, right? So it's where do you house that population? Where the population is stagnant and you don't have the market demand, um, you know, we're, we've worked in some other metros where it's really about identifying what that strategic investment is that starts to change perceptions of a neighborhood. Um, it's that strategic investment that starts to uh, focus growth where it can happen. You know, I, I think that one of the challenges of, a, of working where there's not a lot of demand is the um, tendency to spread the investments out along the entire corridor. When really, if you could focus those, you'd have a better better return. Um, and of course, it's also about the fact that in almost any area of the United States, the fact that transit is a walkable commodity, walkable neighborhood is actually a very rare um, uh, um, community. So so I, th I think those are some of the approaches that might work. I, I don't know, Jason, Randy, did you want to add to that? No. I think that covers it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, which elements of the ETOD playbook face the most community resistance? Oh, that's probably a Jason question. Right, I don't really think any of them face community resistance because of the process that we used to get there in the end. That said, I, th I think that as we get a little bit more specific in actually implementing some of the strategies, again, I don't know if resistance is the right word, but I, there will be some more conversation. So, and specifically uh, the zoning changes as we start to look to make those. I think for a lot of people, that's when it gets more real. You get a letter that says the city is proposing to change your zoning. And I think people tend to tune in a little bit more, but Overall, I, I still think the process arrived at the kind of results that when we're having those zoning conversations, uh, of course, there's, you're never going to have 100% consensus on anything, but I think we're well positioned to have those conversations because the, those changes are going to reflect those broader community goals. And there's a very good story that we can tell, again, talking about um, starting from that point of people are coming to the area, what's the best way to uh, accommodate that? that I think it will make us successful through that process as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, there's not really resistance, but there were a lot of questions at the public session about the affordable housing. So people are, uh, uh, most people are very supportive with higher density, but talking about how to address affordability, they have questions about uh, how long those affordable units uh, should last, uh, how much percentage of the affordable housing should be provided, and also like the depth of the affordable housing. That was a big conversation mm -hmm. at all the um, public engagement sessions. That's Thank it. You. Uh, the next question is, what is the role of public uh, participation in developing equitable uh, toolkits? And how did you build uh, trust and ensure voices from traditionally undeserved, underserved communities? So I'll, I'll yeah. start with that. Uh, and I think Miranda touched on, on one of the elements, which is 
Uh, the question that we got a lot is affordable to who? So just saying affordable, I think people are savvy enough now to know that can mean a pretty broad spectrum of incomes. And in a metro where the median income is fairly high, even if you're looking at 80%, then that feels out of reach for a lot of people. So that was a question that we often heard and that, that shaped the outcome, as Miranda mentioned. Um, we looked for ways that would be feasible to get that lower and to serve uh, lower income households. And that was really important. And in terms of the process, one thing that we found, and this is just true regardless um, of income level, but you're never really gonna hit everybody through those traditional input means of, hey, let's have a meeting and take two hours out of your time and come show up. Those are great conversations and they're essential, but you just won't um, get mm -hmm. a full spectrum through that. So we did a lot of other means of outreach. And I think most people who um, use those same techniques pop up and online. But one thing I would say that was a little bit different that was really important is we tried to be where the conversations were and take that input in regardless of whether it was the quote unquote official meeting or official process. So there's lots of conversations organically happening in the community and we tried to be there whenever we could. And that actually was a significant way that we heard from people and a very different slice um, demographically than we would have gotten had we just uh, said we're only gonna hear what we hear through these official meetings and surveys. Thank you. Um, there's a question about uh, how long is the implementation period and how soon uh, did the city adopt the zoning changes? Well, I think in terms of near-term steps, literally in the process now, uh, so our planning commission is looking at those changes to the zoning overlays and we'll make a recommendation to city council probably in the next couple months. We've initiated a process to start uh, a city initiated rezoning along some of the corridors. I mentioned we're doing more specific planning on one of those. So we're gonna let that process uh, create some zoning changes along that corridor, but going ahead on the other ones and starting to apply that because the, the overlays guarantee a more walkable form and provide that height bonus. And we wanna go ahead and put that on the ground. So. Uh, those steps happening, we do think there's going to be, in terms of imp implementation, there's some more medium steps like setting up that equity fund. And of course, that will take some time to actually produce some larger amounts of revenue. And so some decisions about how to use that uh, probably will be a few years down the road. Thank you. Um, your thoughts on the biggest challenges ahead? I'm, you might have covered it in the last answer. <laughs> Well, I think the biggest challenges are that um, there's going to continue to be a, a significant amount of affordability pressure. That's it's not going away. And for every person that we talked with in this process, there are other people who probably didn't participate in that process and are, are going to have lots of questions and concerns. And so it's it's going to be a conversation that, that Raleigh and other similar cities are, are going to have for um, some time to come. Thank you. Have mm -hmm. you considered low carbon footprint solutions in the planning stage? We did, that was pretty explicit and that's something the city of Raleigh does consistently now, whether it's just uh, an individual rezoning process, we take we try to take a look at, is this generally likely to, to lead to more or less per capita carbon emissions? And the same with planning process, we highlight the fact that so for instance, it's kind of obvious here, but not necessarily to a lot of plant participants that growing more around transit is gonna bring down uh, our carbon emissions. It's, it's a climate change strategy. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point for planners to bring out because I think so many people still think of climate change as something only to be solved at say the Washington DC level and isn't something that in fact um, can be done and will have to be successfully addressed at the uh, level of the individual municipality. So that, that's something that we hit uh, very hard now in our planning efforts. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add that, that that is a really good example of how uh, a, a truly equitable outcome touches on many, many, many issues that you that may not be thought of as, as related to equity. 
um, there, there's a, that's a really good example of, of um, taking a deeper dive and how a real, uh, you know, building a community takes a lot of um, inputs and outputs that you may not think of. Thank you. Uh, there are many more questions. Apologies if, we're not, if we don't have time for uh, to address them all now. Um, we'll take the last question. What are the major sources of transit funding for this transit agency? So a major source is a local sales tax that came out of that planning process several years back where Raleigh and Wake County re-envisioned our, our transit network and transit future. And that laid the groundwork for a successful referendum. And so that is providing the local match for a lot of the capital projects. And we've successfully obtained some um, federal funding for one of the BRT corridors and are very optimistic given that local match and given the story we're able to tell about the supportive planning and zoning to be able to obtain that money for the other corridors as well. Thank you. So we're at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with the team via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you for your time. And a big thank you, Jason, uh, John and Miranda for a fantastic uh, presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.